respiratory system. Many people don't respect this beautiful network of bronchioles and airways. Look at this. With irritation, the linings of these bronchioles are going to produce mucus, and mucus over time may start to damage the walls. And that's not the only thing that goes wrong when we start to inhale irritants such as cigarette smoke. Many people don't realize, but cigarette smoke affects the very alveoli that absorb oxygen with each breath. You see this picture? See how la elastic these guys are? There are these grape-like clusters called alveoli. However, when they're destroyed, then we can no longer uh, absorb oxygen through them. And uh, eventually these people go on oxygen uh, tanks, and it's a life of being a prisoner to this little tank. And much of it's avoidable. Rhinoplasty. I've had rhinoplasty done, and I'm not very good looking. I had it done because my, uh, I had a deviated septum. The septal uh, cartilage, which you can see the diagram here, it divides the right and left half of the internal nares. And um, my, I just couldn't breathe out on one side because I'd had it smashed long ago when I was not very smart. Uh, but we, uh, sometimes it's done for cosmetic reasons as well. Nasal cavity up at the top. And you can see the concha, superior, middle, inferior. And they're nice little traps because if you ever breathe out on a cold morning, you see a mist, you see your breath. Well, that happens all the time. Did you know that? Even when it's warm, you exhale uh, a mist of droplets. And so these, these uh, concha help to trap some of that water. It keeps us from being dehydrated. Nasopharynx. So here's a soft palate. And that's what we depress if you have hiccups. Uh, we have a special tool in the hospital where you can push and stop the hiccups. Or if you just drink water upside down, sometimes it depresses that soft palate. Why am I talking about the soft palate? Well, because it's a dividing line between the oops, nasopharynx, the airway here, and the oral pharynx, which is a posterior to the tongue and the oral cavity. Nasopharynx has the pharyngeal uh, tonsils. Oral pharynx has the palatine and lingual tonsils. They all have the same purpose, though, to uh, defend us from invaders. The laryngopharynx is down below the epiglottis. This little epiglottis is going to drop down when we swallow food so that we don't choke on it. Tonsillectomy done if there's chronic inflammation. Okay, It's not our uh, first choice. We're going to treat the patient for several months on di different antibiotics. But if we have um, this thing just won't go away, it gets pretty uh, gross looking. Um, or if it's going to obstruct the airway, then those tonsils are removed. The voice box or larynx, there's a thyroid cartilage. You're seeing a, the backside of it. So here's the um, thyroid cartilage. And that is going to form the laryngeal prominence. When a, uh, a child hits puberty, a little bit older, then this is going to uh, expand, especially in the males. And the arytenoid cartilage influence the tension on the vocal folds. Now I'll get to that shortly. Coryza, the common cold. Many of us harbor the cold virus in our um, internal nares here, and they, and, the, and they just kind of stay there unless we get chilled. And if our nose, if, it's kind of bizarre, if our nose gets really cold, it seems to trigger some kinds of viruses to start uh, becoming active. Okay, that's not part of my lecture here though. Uh, one of the problems with the cold is it's going to pr uh, progress into a secondary infection such as sinusitis, infection of sinuses, ear infections, asthma, and bronchitis. I'll be mentioning these shortly. The flu or influenza is a little more serious than the cold generally. We have the same kind of symptoms like nasal congestion, sneezing, uh, runny nose, but we also have sometimes headache, fever, and muscular aches. Typically, uh, influenza is more serious because uh, it's, it can progress into... Um, well, many different things, scarlet fever, pneumonia, and people die from it. Epiglottis. Do you remember I just showed you the epiglottis? That's that little fold that's going to drop when we swallow, forming a lid over the um, trachea here. 
and, and we know that if the international ch choking uh, sign is you put both hands around your throat. And Heimlich is still pretty good. You can do a Heimlich on yourself. It just doesn't work as well. Cricoid. Okay, we have cartilage to protect the airway. Cricoid to the far upper right. And the trachea here. There's the thyroid cartilage. I mentioned the prominence. Also a site for ligaments to attach. The glottis is a narrow part. This is really cool. So here's our vocal cords. We have the vestibular folds, which they're calling ventricular. There's different, different names, but they're the outer false vocal cords that come together when we hold our breath. And you can see why, because here's the airway. Here's the two vocal cords, which are connected ligaments. And when they pull, we get those high-pitched sounds. And when they relax, we get low pitch sounds. That didn't work too well. And whispering is when uh, the vocal cords are closed, but the rim of glottis, uh, here it is, that is open. So there's no pitch. I can't, if I say I'm not whispering, because you can hear sounds. Laryngitis, you see the suffix itis, so inflammation of the larynx. Here we have a nice little diagram. Of course, a voice or even loss of voice may happen when those vocal folds, which we know what those are now, they can't vibrate because they're swollen, they're thick. Uh, instead of being like a drum head, now they're like um, like a pancake or something. They, they just won't uh, vibrate. Chronic laryngitis occurs to smokers who develop cancer of the larynx. So, now, this is a nice example. Look at this picture here. This is what the lining of the airways look like in much of our um, bronchial tree. We have these ciliated cells, and these are going to trap debris. And the mucus is going to help. They work together, and they're going to slowly force it down our throat so we swallow it. That's what we want to happen. Uh, there are C-shaped rings of tracheal cartilage. I mentioned the cricoid. Now, let's say someone has an obstruction in the airway above the larynx. If you have to, although... I, it's usually not necessary. Uh, uh, intubation is better, but a short incision above the cricoid cartilage, and then you insert a little tube, which they're not showing here, but uh, you've probably seen it. Like these movies, they show guys sticking like a hollow straw or a pen or something in there. Yeah, really, there's better ways in most cases, than, and one is just to intubate. Here's a laryngoscope, and that's used to pull the tongue out of the way. There's usually a little light there. The new ones are plastic and disposable, but these old ones are pretty good. They're metal. And there's the intubation tube. And it's not going to go all the way down in the lungs because then you have a chance of piercing the heart. You just want to get it down to a point. Um, oh, and you can suction. And sometimes suctioning is really a nice thing to do. Bronchi this is a bronchial tree, so we have the left and right main bronchus. Bronchus is singular for bronchi. And they're going to divide into lobar and then the lobar. Oops, I'm losing there. The lobar divide into segmentals and bronchioles at the very end. And here's what a bronchial looks like. It doesn't have the uh, cricoid cartilage around it. It has smooth muscles. And so when someone has an asthmatic reaction, then the you can see the walls of the bronchi are going to thicken because of um, immune cells. And, and not everybody gets asthma the same way. It's not always pollen or dust or sudden cold or exercise induced. Sometimes it's uncertain what causes it, maybe even nervousness. It's a very complex disease, and many people get on inhalers, which is a good idea to uh, reduce the likelihood of scarring. Bronchitis, you see the itis, inflammation, or infection of the bronchi. So we know what the bronchi are now, all these uh, airways. And we know what the goblet and mucus cells, they line the, uh, the, the lining. And too much uh, thickened mucus interferes with cilia. So when you are sick, you want to strive for uh, watery mucus. Inspiration is just breathing in. in what happens is the diaphragm, which is below the lungs, is going to contract. And what does that? Those muscles are going to move upwards and change the shape of the lungs. You can see here in this video I have flowing the intercostal muscles, which you can't see. Those are between the ribs. 
they're going to move the rib cage up and outwards as we breathe in. And air pressure inside the lung is lower than the outside. We call it the outside atmospheric. And air is going to follow this gradient from high to low pressure so that it flows into our alveoli and uh, is absorbed in the bloodstream. Pleural sac, and I like this nice cutaway. You can see the two layers of the pleura. There is a space between them called the pleural cavity. And there is a lubricating fluid that allows the lungs to expand and contract and without a lot of friction occurring. And so we need these little serous membranes. But there's sometimes a problem if the fluid between them, and there's not much fluid, but if it becomes uh, inflamed, then we have what's called pleurisy. Or uh, if this goes on long enough or there's enough pressure, let's say there's a you know, lung cancer going on, or some severe lung disease, then pressure may force fluids into this pleural cavity and they're going to apply pressure to the lungs. And finally, sometimes a long needle needs to be inserted through the, um, well, often between the ribs here, the intercostals, to um, expel that, that uh, fluid. So it's going to cause problems. We use a spirometer to measure um, lung volume, and that's in milliliters of air. The tidal volume is just, if you take a look below here, this is what a spirometer would show. This is a normal breath, and it does look like tidal wave, um, uh, ocean waves. Inspiratory reserve is the air that can be forcibly inhaled. So you take a regular breath, and then <gasps> whatever you can do past that. Ventilation uh, rate is the number of breaths per minute. I mentioned the spirometer. Here we have vital capacity. That's the milliliters of air. When we expire or when we breathe out, so here we have it, the breathing out. And then residual volume is air is not expired. So we have this amount of air that never leaves our lungs, but don't worry, uh, air does circulate within the lung tissue. A lung quality, that tends to be uh, objective, like uh, ronky, snoring sounds, such as pneumonia, Strider and wheezing, a narrowed or occluded airway, like sometimes the kid swallows a popsicle stick. These chemoreceptors in the pons and medulla will detect when the pH is low, and that means there's a buildup of carbon dioxide. And an impulse is going to be sent from the brainstem to the phrenic nerve, and we start to hyperventilate, causing us to expel excess carbon dioxide. And as we do so, we uh, return our lung pH, our blood pH, to near neutral. Variations, we have nitrogen darkosis, depths over 150 feet. Uh, nitrogen gas dissolves in the tissues. Okay, that happens naturally. We're not even thinking about it, but if we rise to the surface too quickly, then uh, nitrogen bubbles will form in the blood, causing decompression sickness or the bends. And here's my daughter, so very happy, but I'm not looking so good there, <laughs> coming up from the ocean there. Uh, hypoxia due to high altitude. And some low environments, like in the Himalayas here, these two guys perhaps saved my life. I was struggling. I had hypoxia. And I was in the first response, breathing rapidly, called tachypnea. And I had definitely shortness of breath, dyspnea. And that's because there wasn't, wasn't enough oxygen for me, for, for my, um, my physiology. A secondary response is a little more serious. In this case, we have pulmonary edema, which you can see the diagram to the far right. Uh, that fluid in the alveoli, these are the grape-like clusters of alveoli, is going to interfere with the absorption of oxygen and the release of carbon dioxide. So uh, here again, we're going to have that acidic um, blood which can uh, tip us over the edge and people die of pulmonary edema. Or uh, an embolism, and this, is, this can happen not just in um, high altitudes, but anytime we have a chunk of a plaque or a, a blood that flows into the lungs and causes a blockage, now we have a whole region of the lungs that is uh, ineffective.